Hello everyone, this is Misha Houston, and I'm here to do my review of Game of Thrones. Tonight's episode is entitled, The Dragon and the Wolf. And I must say that I enjoyed parts of the episode, but not the episode as a whole. I just didn't. I liked the beginning, you know, with the armistice, and I loved the ending with the White Walkers, but there were some parts in the middle that just didn't sit right with me. But I do want to say that I enjoyed the season. It was a lot better than the fifth season, I can't say that. Season five was a train wreck, but this, you know, was a little bit better, much better than it was, you know, back in season five. Season seven, you know, I enjoyed season seven, you know, mostly. Mostly, I enjoyed it. And this episode, as I said before, I enjoyed the beginning and I enjoyed the end. But there were parts in the middle that I didn't. Thank you. The first group of people we go to is John and Company, Cersei and Company, and Danny and Company. You know, for the armistice of King's Landing. Everyone is gathering at King's Landing for the armistice. The Unsullied are outside of King's Landing, while the Lannister soldiers and Bronn are preparing the walls just in case they attack. The Lannister army has only 500 barrels of oil, and Bronn wants 500 more. Bronn loves it. He loves it as they call him Lord, but Jaime tells him that the thrill will fade. Jamie and Bronn are on the walls looking at the Unsullied. Bronn says he never would fight if he were a eunuch because there would be nothing to fight for. Jamie says he could fight for gold, but Bronn says soldiers spend their gold on a family which he does not have. Bronn says you can't have a family without a cock. Bronn says Tyrion has sided with the cockless. Jamie says that he has been a champion of the downtrodden for a very long time. A horn sounds, and the Dothraki come charging through, charging on their horses, screaming and yelling and making their presence known. Bronn says that we are about to become the downtrodden. Then Tyrion, John Davos, along with five ships, come sailing in for the armistice. John asks Tyrion how many people live in King's Landing. Tyrion replies, saying that there are a million people here. John observes that a million people live here, which is more than the north, and all are crammed into one city. He asks, why would anyone want to live like this? Tyrion answers, there is more work in the city, and the brothels are far superior. Now, below decks, below the deck of the ship, the hound goes to the box, holding the white walker that they abducted from the north. He kicks the box. He kicks the box and pushes it, and the wife starts squealing and shaking inside of the box. In the red keep, Cersei asks Kyburn, why hasn't Daenerys showed up yet? Kyburn answers, no one has seen her, but the rest of them, including Tyrion, are on their way to King's Landing. Cersei tells the Mountain, if anything goes wrong, kill Daenerys, Tyrion, Jon, and the rest of them, he can kill any way and order he sees fit. Cersei, Kyburn, Jaime, and the Mountain then leave for the Dragon Pit. Outside the Red Keep, Tyrion, Jon, Jorah, Masande, and etc. are walking and talking about the Dragon Pit. 
Masande asks, why did they build the dragon pit in the first place? Jorah replies that the dragons don't know the difference between what is theirs and what is not. Letting them roam over the city became a problem. Tyrion says the dragon pit stunted the growth of dragon, of the dragons until they were sickly and as small as, you know, small dogs. When Beleriand the Dread was there, it was the most dangerous place in the world. Bronn and the Lannister soldiers, including Pod and Brienne, arrive to welcome the escort. John and Tyrion and company to the dragon pit. Both Brienne and the Hound are surprised to see each other. Pod, Podrick and Tyrion both speak to each other. Both Tyrion and Pod are glad that they have both survived. One of the Lannister soldiers asks the Hound what's in the box, and the Hound replies saying fuck off. Brienne then speaks to the Hound herself. She thought that he was dead. Brienne says that she was only trying to protect Arya and said that and then he said that he was trying to do the same. Brienne says Arya is alive in Winterfell. The Hound then asks Brienne who is protecting Arya now. And Brienne says that the only person that needs to be protected is the fool that stands in her way. As they are walking, Tyrion tries to buy Bronn off, but Bronn says it's cool and that he's just looking out for himself. Bronn says that it, it is Tyrion that Cersei wants dead, not him. Bronn says that he got two traitors walking through the gates, and it's all thanks to himself. Tyrion says it's good to see him again, and Bronn concurs. The Hound then leaves the box with the Lannister soldiers and says that if anyone touches it, he will kill them first. Everyone comes to the dragon pit, and John and company sit down. The Hound asks if he's going to die in this shit city, and Tyrion replies that he might. The Hound says every bad idea has some Lannister cunt behind it. Tyrion says that some Clegane cunt is there to see him through. See it through. Tyrion, excuse me, Cersei and company walk over to the pit and take their seats. The hound then gets in the mountain's face, saying that he will kill him one day. Cersei wants to know where Daenerys is, and Tyrion says that she didn't travel with us. Then Daenerys flies in on Drogon. But you notice that only Drogon and Rhaegal are present. Viserion is not there. Cersei complains to Danny about her being late, and Danny apologizes. Tyrion stands up to speak, but Euron speaks over him and tells Theon that if he doesn't submit to him, that he will kill Yara. Then Euron, you know, talks down and condescends to Tyrion saying that he wouldn't let a dwarf live in the Iron Islands as courtesy to their parents. Cersei orders Euron to sit down, and he eventually does. Then Tyrion addresses the crowd again, wanting, you know, for everyone to come together. Then Jon stands up to speak about the war for the dawn. He warns Cersei that the Night King and the White Walkers are coming and they are marching south past the wall. Cersei thinks that this is all a lie and a ploy. Cersei believes that it is a ploy for Danny, for Danny to solidify her claim to the throne, but Danny assures her it's not and gives Cersei her word. Cersei says that she doesn't trust her at all and calls her a usurper. Tyrion brings forth the hound with the box. He slowly unlatches it and unhooks it and opens the box, but nothing comes out. Then he kicks it over, and the white goes charging straight for Cersei. The hound manages to wrangle it back in the nick of time, and he cuts it in half with his sword. The white is still moving. He's cut the white in half, but it is still moving. 
Kyburn then takes the hand, you know, takes one of the the white's hands and examines it, noticing that it is still moving. John says, if we don't come together, we will, this right here, this corpse will be the fate of everyone in Westeros and maybe even the world. He says, we can either kill it by setting it on fire, which he does, you know, to the moving hand, or we can kill it by put you stabbing it with dragon glass. And John stabs the corpse with the dragon glass and it eventually falls and dies. Danny says that she saw them all with her own eyes, even though she didn't believe it. She says that there's at least a hundred thousand of them at least. Euron then gets up and goes to the corpse and asks, can they swim? And John says, no, they cannot. Euron then declares that he's going home and taking his fleet with him back to the Iron Islands. And he advises Danny to go back to Dragonstone. He says, when the war is over, they'll be the only ones left alive. Cersei calls Euron a coward but understands why he's afraid. And she then agrees to the alliance, but on one condition. She agrees if John swears to never take up arms against the Lannisters. She says that she doesn't trust Daenerys and would never make that offer to her, but she would make it to Ned Stark's son. John says that he can't serve two queens, and he will only serve Danny. Cersei says then if if there is no you know if there is no compromise in you on this if you're not willing to accept my terms then then we're done here. You know she tells them pretty much you can't be my enemy and ally at the same time. She says that these creatures are in the north and they will come for you first. So good luck fighting them. And whatever is left the the Lannisters will destroy. After Cersei walks away, Brienne implores Jaime to talk to the queen. Davos tells Jon that he should not have said that to her. And Danny says that she appreciates his loyalty, but by telling Cersei that, my dragon just died for nothing. Tyrion is glad that he bent the knee, but he should have lied to Cersei which I think is true as well. I think it was really, really foolish of him to tell Cersei that, you know, you serve with me and fight with me now so I can stab you in the back later. I don't blame Cersei for leaving. John is offended by lying and telling lies, but he says that lies won't help us against the White Walkers. Tyrion thinks, that they are all screwed, but he wants to talk to Cersei alone, which is very, very dangerous considering the fact that Tyrion killed Tywin, her father, and sent Marcella off to be killed by the Dornish. With the mountain on his heels, Tyrion goes to talk to Cersei. Outside the hand's chambers, Jaime thinks that they are both idiots, but Tyrion goes to see Cersei anyway. Cersei sees Tyrion as nothing but a person who wants the destruction of House Lannister. Tyrion denies it adamantly, but she states that the death of her mother, father, Tommen, and Marcella is proof of it, and that he doesn't want to hear any of his excuses. And once again, I totally agree with Cersei. I wouldn't want to hear his excuses either. I mean, he says that he loves his family, but he's put, he's killed one of them, well, actually killed two of them, and put a, a child, his own niece that loved him, in danger. I mean, he wants to believe that he loves his family, but I never believed he did, not even in the books. Tyrion admits it. He admits that, you know, he doesn't love his family and wants to see him them destroyed, and then challenges Cersei to kill him. She gives it consideration. She thinks about it, but in the end, she stays her hand. Tyrion says that he is so sorry about Tommen and Marcella and said that he loved them. Cersei says it doesn't care, you know, she doesn't care about his feelings, only about what it cost us. 
it cost us our future. She says that when you killed Ty, when you left us open and the vultures almost tore us apart, tore us apart. Tyrion asks, why did you let me come here? Why did you let us all come? You must have been hoping for something. And then she asks him, what do you hope for? That me and Jon Snow will kneel to, to Daenerys, to your new queen? Tyrion says, yes. Because he believes that Danny will make the world a better place. Cersei reminds him that he just said that she would destroy all of King's Landing if she didn't get her way. Tyrion says that Danny chose him because he could check her and curb her worst impulses. Cersei says she doesn't want to curb her impulses. She only wants to protect what matters to her the most. She then touches her belly. She then touches her belly, you know, knowing, you know, that she herself is pregnant. Cersei says that maybe Euron Greyjoy had the right, right idea. Maybe it's best that we all just sail away from here. And then Tyrion looks at her and realizes that she is pregnant. Cersei is pregnant. Back at the dragon pit. Daenerys and Jon see the bones of the old dragons. Danny wishes he hadn't done that, but he, but excuse me, she respects it. She respects his loyalty. Danny says the dragon pit was the beginning of the end of the Targaryens. She says that the dragons fill the world with wonder and awe, and we lock them all away. They grew small, and so did the Targaryens. Danny says that we weren't extraordinary without them. John disagrees, but Danny says that I'll never have another child, that the Targaryen line will end with her. John says that the witch that killed your husband may not have been right. Danny says he was she, that he was yeah Danny says that he was right from the beginning about the white walkers and that had she trusted him and believed in him things would be different which is very true Danny says that she can't forget what she saw in the north but she also can't forget Cersei taking over the country either John then agrees that they are both screwed Tyrion comes back bringing Cersei and her, you know, Cersei and her entourage with with the uh, with her. Cersei says that she will help fight them. You know, she will help fight, you know, the monsters and the white walkers in the north. And that she's going to call her banners. But she also knows that she, you know, she you know she tells them that maybe you should remember that she is is the one helping them without any assurances from them. So that was, you know, the armistice. And I thought it was a very, very good and entertaining section of the story. I was very pleased with it. I, I was pleased with all of it. I really liked it. But there was one thing I wanted to say. John said that you can kill the White Walkers with, you know, the dragon glass or with fire, but you can also kill them with Valyrian steel. I'm surprised that he didn't bring that up. He had a Valyrian steel sword in his hand. He should have said, hey, you can kill them three ways, with fire, with the dragon glass, and with the Valyrian steel. But I, I, don't, under, I'm, I don't understand why, you know, he didn't mention that or why the writers didn't include that in the script, but, you know. Now, the next two people we go to is Sansa and Peter Baelish. A raven is struggling to get to Winterfell, but it eventually does. Sansa has the raven scroll in her hand, and it says that John have Danny. Yeah, John and Danny have united together. She knows that John has bent the knee and obviously doesn't care enough to consult her. Baelish says that da da Daenerys is very beautiful, and they are both young and unmarried. He says that if they did marry, they would be very hard to defeat. He suggests that Jon should be unnamed King of the North 
But Sansa knows Arya would never betray John for Sansa. She would, yeah, yes. Sansa says that Arya would kill anyone who dared, you know, try to hurt her family. Baelish asks her, do you think she would kill her own sister? And then Sansa asks him a question. Do you know what she is and who these faceless men are? Bayless says that he knows them only by reputation. They said, you know, he says that they worship the god of death. Sansa says they are killers, nothing but killers, and she is one of them. Bayless says that he plays a game in his mind to understand people's true motives. He tells her to imagine the worst case scenario involving Arya, and Sansa does. Sansa realizes that Arya would kill her, use the season one letter to rob as a justification to become Lady of Winterfell. Now, I know that people don't like Baelish, and I don't hold it against anyone who doesn't like him, but I have to say that he is right. Baelish warned Sansa that Jon would take her power away, and that is what Jon has done. He took it all away and didn't even think to consult her about anything. Made this huge decision and didn't even consult the legitimate heir to Winterfell. But, I mean, you know, that, that's, I guess that's just, that's just the way it is and that's just the way it is. John, the next group of people we go to is John and Danny and company. Back at Dragonstone, everyone is discussing how to proceed north for the Alliance. John wants to sail to White Harbor and then ride with the Dothraki to Winterfell, while Jorah wants her to just fly in on her dragon. Danny, since she doesn't want to appear like the conqueror that she is, she decides to sail and ride with John. And then there is a little moment and a little bit of tension between John, Danny, and Jor. Then John and Theon talk, and he admires John for doing all, you know, for always doing the right thing, even when they were young and stupid. Theon confesses that he could never really make a proper decision. For him, it was always either Stark, Stark or Greyjoy. John then chastises him for the betrayal of Ned, saying that he was more that he was more of a father than Balon Greyjoy ever was. Leon fully agrees with this and he knows that it was wrong. John says that you never lost a part of who you are, and whatever I can, I will forgive you for it. Then Theon talks about his sister, Yara who tried to rescue him from Ramsay. He tells John that she is in need of him now, and John asks him, what are you doing here talking to me? So we know that Theon's story in season eight is, is going to be about him rescuing his sister Yara from, from Euron Greyjoy. Outside, Theon brings up rescuing Yara to the other Ironborn. The other Ironborn just wants to sail away from Westeros and find a new home to plunder. But Theon wants to stay and help Yara. It becomes a battle between Theon and the other Ironborn. The Ironborn man beats, you know, beats up Theon completely, but he refuses to stay down. Theon eventually beats up the other Ironborn and takes over command from him. Then Theon yells Yara's name and the rest of the Ironborn yell, yell her name back and agree to follow him. Theon then staggers to the sea and throws seawater over his face. You know, it's, that is probably one of the storylines that I'm really looking forward to in season, in season eight. The Theon storyline is definitely one of the storylines I'm looking forward to seeing. The next group of people we go to is Sansa, Arya, Bran, Peter Baelish, the Northern Lords, and Bronze Yon Royce. 
and in my opinion, one of the worst scenes of the episode. Sansa is standing outside, covered up, looking sad and hurt. Then she straightens herself up, and then she walks over to a guard, saying, Bring Arya to the great room. In the great room, Arya comes in. Arya asks Sansa, Are you sure you, you want to do this? And Sansa says, No, I don't want to do it. But honor demands it of me. Sansa wants to defend the North and her family against people who would hurt and betray betray them. She then, you know, calls forth Peter Baelish instead of Arya, and she traps him there. He steps forward. She goes down the laundry list of things that he has done. John Aaron, the War of the Five Kings, Liza Aaron, etc. And he denies it all. And, but Bran, who is a seer, who is a green seer and a warg, knows the truth about all of the things that he has done. Baelish then says that he has the right to protect himself. And then he goes to Bronn's Jon Royce and demands that he be taken back to the Vale. But Bronn's Jon Royce refuses him. He then pleads to Sansa. Oh, he pleads to Sansa, saying that he loved her and that he loved Catelyn. Sansa says that she knows this, but she says she also says that she be, that he betrayed us both. He betrayed Catelyn and Sansa. He begs and cries, but none, no one in the room is moved by it. Arya then walks over to him and cuts his throat. And as I said before, it was probably the worst scene of the night. It's not so much that he was killed. It was the, the way they had him looking. The way they had him begging and crying like he was some coward. And Peter Baelish is not a coward. I think that he is a bold and courageous character. He may work in the shadows and schemes and plots, but he's really a courageous character at heart and he did tell Sansa the truth about John you know about John and Arya but he's dead they killed him off and I think that his death was no more than a fan service death to prop up Sansa and please the fans I, I, I can handle seeing him die but I just thought him begging and crying was not his true character they made him look like a coward to embarrass him and to prop Sansa up. I don't think for a minute that that was the way the real Peter Baelish would die. Not like this. He would go out fighting. He would go out trying to negotiate and work his way out of it. He wouldn't just collapse like that on the floor. He wouldn't. He certainly would not, no. <sighs> The next group of people we go to is Cersei, Jaime, the Mountain, and the Lannister soldiers. Jaime is preparing for their voyage up north with the Lannister soldiers when Cersei walks in. Cersei reveals to him that she has no intention of ever helping Jon and Daenerys. And, you know, I can't really blame her for that. I can't blame her because we all know that once the fighting is done, they will turn on Cersei and betray her. She says straight up, I don't trust any of them. Cersei believes that the northern threat is real, but she but that doesn't mean that she could ever trust John or Daenerys, especially after John just said that he would take up arms against her with Daenerys. Euron, you know, Euron saying that he is going back to the Iron Island was a lie and a scheme. Cersei says Euron is leaving Westeros to hire sellsword companies so she can rebuild her army. Jamie then realizes that Cersei plotted with Euron and didn't tell him. He feels that she doesn't love him or trust him anymore, not like he loves and trusts her. But I, before I go on, I have to say this. Cersei was right about Jamie betraying her. And, you know, that time with Tyrion, when he got the meeting, you know, went to the meeting with Tyrion was not his first betrayal. He ordered Brienne to protect Sansa, which was a betrayal to Cersei. 
So he's been betraying her a lot and him, you know, pretending to be hurt and outraged by this. It, I mean, she was absolutely right not to trust him on this. Jamie then tries to leave her, but the mountain stands in his way. Cersei says that you, no one walks away from me. Cersei, you know, tries to threaten him into staying, but he says that he doesn't believe that she would ever hurt him. Jamie finally leaves Cersei behind, even though, she, and even though she tries to hide it, she is, you know, hurt and heartbroken by it. Jamie is on a horse leaving King's Landing and he puts on his glove when a snowflake falls upon it. He looks up and around and realizes that it's snowing. Winter has finally arrived in the south. I'm glad that Jamie has left Cersei, but in the book he had more justification to do it. He didn't really have much justification here because she was right about him. He was, he was betraying her for a good while now. The next group of people we go to is Brand, you know, Bran, Samuel, John, Danny, Rhaegar, Targaryen, Lyanna Stark, and young Ned Stark. Samuel comes riding into Winterfell wanting to talk to John. He wants to help fight against the army of the dead. Bran says that he is on his way back to Winterfell with Daenerys Targaryen. Samuel tells him that Rhaegar left his wife, left his wife, Elia, Elia Martell, Princess Elia Martell, and married Lyanna Stark in secret, and the marriage was legitimate. Bran then tells Samuel that Lyanna Stark was never kidnapped. She wanted to be with him and she married him with her, you know, with her consent. She wanted to be with him. Robert's rebellion was all based upon a lie. John is not a bastard. He's not an illegitimate child, not a bastard, but, but his name is Aegon Targaryen, Rhaegar's legitimate son and the heir over Daenerys to the Targaryen to the Targaryen throne. On the boat heading north, John knocks on Daenerys' door and they go in and have sex with each other. Targaryen incest. Oh, so disgusting. I mean, I couldn't even really look at that scene. It just disgusted me knowing that they were related and they were sleeping together. I mean, for anyone, in my opinion, to cheer for the two of them, you might as well be cheering for Jamie and Cersei. It's all incest and it's all disgusting to me, in my opinion. Tyrion is in the hallway and, and he sees what's going on. So as I said before, Jon is, is not a bastard. His name is Aegon Targaryen and he's the legitimate heir to the Targaryen dynasty. So it's very interesting. I'm very interested to see how that plays out. But I'm also interested in Samwell. What is Samuel going to say and do when he finds out that Daenerys, John's new girlfriend, murdered his father and his brother? There should be some kind of revenge for that. If Sansa and Arya are killing Baelish for revenge, then it needs to be some revenge there too for Samuel, for his father and his brother. Absolutely without question. It shouldn't just be a free pass. No way. The next two people we go to is Sansa and Arya. They are both standing on the walls of Winterfell. Arya asks if she is okay. Sansa says it's a strange feeling. She says that in his own horrible way, she knew that he truly loved her. Arya says that she did do the right thing. But Arya, you know, excuse me, Sansa says that, she, that Arya was the one who did the deed. Arya says that she was the one who passed the sentence. I mean, they're both guilty of it. They're both, they both wanted him dead and they both did it. Absolutely. Arya also says that she never would have survived all the things that she did. And Sansa says that Arya is the strongest person that she knows. Arya takes that for a compliment. Then Sansa says something that Ned used to say. When the snows fall and the white winds blow, the lone wolf dies, but the pack survives. 
Arya says she misses him, and Sansa does too. Now, before I go on to the last scene, I totally understand it. I totally understand it, but as I said before, Sansa is is never going to be the queen. She's never going to be over Danny. She's going to be forever underneath John and Danny's hill. She'll never be queen of the north. Never. And as for Arya, if if, if Sansa steps out of line, she is going to threaten Sansa back into submission. I promise you that. So whatever Baelish has done, he did tell the truth about John and Arya. I don't think that Sansa should have killed Arya, but in my opinion, I don't think that she should have killed Baelish either. I mean, I would have been satisfied with him being imprisoned or him being punished somehow. You know, I mean, anything but death. And the way they had him dying, squealing like a pig and crying, it, it just didn't feel like the true Baelish at all. But the story is the story. The last scene of the night, and the best scene of the night in my opinion, belongs to Bran, Tormund, Beric, and the White Walkers. Bran is in warg mode underneath the, the heart tree. The ravens are flying to East Watch by the sea. Tormund and Beric are on the walls looking over the north. Tormund is not used to the heights, but people are telling him that he'll get used to it in time. Tormund and Beric then see the White Walkers coming out of the forest. The White Walkers are on the move and they're ready to march south. The hornsman blows three blasts for the White Walkers. Tormund and Beric are horrified by what they see down there. They know that the threat is coming. And just then, the Night's King comes flying in on Viserion's back. Viserion is dead, but he has been arisen. And he is spitting blue flame at the wall. He lights up the wall. He just blows fire onto the wall and it brings part of the wall down the men on the wall are running and they're running and trying to get away as part of the wall collapses i don't know if torment or Beric survived that exchange but we'll have to see in season eight the wall you know enough of the wall eventually comes down you know you know, eventually comes down at East Watch by the sea, and the White Walkers march in. They march in past the wall, and the Night King flies in on Viserion, and that is where the season ends. That was very much my favorite part of the episode. The first scene with the armistice at, and the end with the White Walker invasion. Those were my best scenes. I have two MVPs of this episode. My first MVP is Cersei because I liked how she handled herself at the armistice. She was definitely in charge of what was going on there. And I like the fact that she manages to get the truth out of John, having John tell the truth that he will turn against her once the War for the Dawn is over. So for that, I name her my MVP. My other MVP of the night was Viserion. Viserion never looked more amazing. That dragon was just amazing. He just, it just took down the wall. The whole look of it, the feel of it was just amazing. It was right on par with the books of Game of Thrones, and I just loved it. I absolutely loved it. It was my favorite scene of the night. So for that, my MVPs are Cersei and Viserion. Come back next season, you know, for my next review. I think that the new season is going to come out in 2019. I think they're going to take a little bit of time to work on the, on the last six episodes. And I'm totally fine with that. I'm totally cool. And hopefully this year, The Winds of Winter will come out. I'm very much looking forward to that as well. 
So make sure you come back, all my Game of Thrones subscribers, come back in a little while for the next for the next episode in 2019. If you like my video, make sure you like, comment, share, and subscribe. And if you comment, I will reply to you as soon as I possibly can. Thank you so much, and it's been one crazy season. Thank you so much for sticking with me throughout the season, and I totally, totally appreciate it. Enjoy your life as I do, and have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you so much.